this little dog that I think you're blocking the camera, although that your your people are here to see. Excuse me, little dog. Ah. Alright guys. It is a fine Friday evening here in the collapse of global industrial civilization here on uh what is it? Friday, May 20th, 2022. So the little dog and I, we have been out in the garden all day for some reason. I have no idea what I'm doing with my garden this year. Uh, but anyway, I'm finally, being Friday, getting around to... Uh, Going on my email and checking in with my friends at mongabay.com with Rhett Butler and the boys and girls seeing what's on their minds. And uh, guys, I'm going to step out of, I, I, I guess, character. I've been doing this rant, good Lord, now for, what, 10 years going through this weekly laundry list of threats against our collapsing planet and you know it just starts to run together and this week uh, Red is taking the apocalyptimism just a little bit too far for my personal taste so maybe I'll cover some of these stories tomorrow uh, you know starting out well I'll talk about it tomorrow this uh, woman, Vandana Shiva, from India, and all, he must have, there must be, it seems like half of the stories are about noble savages saving the planet. And guys, you know, by and large, probably, if you take, uh, you know, any group of ten clueless moron white folks and from rich countries and put them up next to 10 indigenous people maybe the maybe the indigenous people are a, a little bit better at saving a planet uh, but it, 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 anyway I'm not going to get off on my noble savage rant people are people humans are humans Okay, and anyway, I'm not going to sit here and just go through the laundry list of the way the noble savages are saving the planet from the damage that all the honkies cause. So anyway, guys, what I'm trying to say is I'm not going to do a Manga Bay Roundup rant. As I say, I might touch on some of these stories in my Hopium Roundup tomorrow. Talk a little bit more about Vandiva. Is it Vandiva Shiva? Anyway, whatever that woman's name is. Uh, but there's two articles right here in the mainstream media that I want to talk about, which I'm going to read. I'm just going to read a little bit of both of them. Uh, do we start with suicides indicate wave of doomerism over escalating climate crisis? Or do I go with age of scarcity begins with $1.6 trillion hit to world economy? I think I'm going to start with this one, and I'll put the link on here. This is a long, involved piece from uh, good old Bloomberg here on the uh, mainstream media today. This they have done their homework. This is Mava cousin Tom Orlick and Bryce Bashuk, whoever they are. But. Um, Anyway, we're going to dive into the age of scarcity, and then we'll come back uh, later on uh, with the wave of doomerism. From the age of scarcity to the wave of doomerism, take it away, Bloomberg. I'm going to read about the first half of this story. 
and then put the link on it and you can finish it from there. The ties that bind the global economy together and delivered goods in abundance across the world are unraveling at a frightening pace. Russia's invasion of Ukraine and China's COVID-0 lockdowns are disrupting supply chains, hammering growth, and pushing inflation to 40-year highs. I spent $6.59 for a gallon of milk today at a gas station at charging $4.89 for a gallon of gas, so I know what they're talking about. Inflation at 40-year highs, they are the chief reasons why Bloomberg Economics has lopped $1.6 trillion off its forecast for global GDP in 2022. But what if that is just an initial hit? War and plague won't last forever. Well, uh, not sure uh, we, will, we will see about war and plague not lasting forever. You know the monkey pox is now killing, starting to kill us all. But the underlying problem, the underlying problem, which is a world increasingly divided along geopolitical fault lines, only looks set to get worse. Yes, Bloomberg Economics has run a simulation of what an accelerated reversal of globalization might look like in the longer term. It points to a significantly poorer and less productive planet with trade back at levels before China joined the World Trade Organization. An additional blow, inflation would likely be higher and more volatile. For investors, a world of nasty surprises on growth and inflation has little to cheer equity or bond markets. So far in 2022, commodities <clears throat> where scarcity drives prices higher have been among the winners along with companies that produce or trade them, and do not forget that shares in defense firms have outperformed also as global tensions soar. Yes, the big winner out of all of this are, of course, the war machine. This is uh, Robert Koopman, the World Trade Organization's chief economist uh, expects a reorganized globalization that comes with a cost. Quote, we will not be able to use low-cost marginal cost production as extensively as we did. Fragmentation is going to stay. For three decades, the defining feature of the world economy has been its ability to churn out ever more goods at ever lower prices. The entry of more than a billion workers from China and the former Soviet bloc into the global labor market, coupled with falling trade barriers and hyper-efficient logistics, produced an age of abundance for many, but the last four years have brought an escalating series of disruptions. Tariff, tariffs multiplied during the U.S.-China trade war. The corona panic brought economic lockdowns, and now sanctions and export controls are upending the supply of commodities and goods. All of this risks leaving advanced economies facing a problem they thought 
they had vanquished long ago, that of scarcity. Emerging nations could see more acute threats to energy and food security like the ones already causing turmoil in countries from Sri Lanka to Peru, and everyone will have to grapple with higher prices. <clears throat> A few numbers illustrate the scale of these new barriers. Tariffs. The trade war saw U.S. charges on Chinese goods rocket up from 3% to about 15% over the course of Donald Trump's presidency. Don't forget lock, lockdowns. This year's co corona panic crackdown in China has put hundreds of billions of dollars in exports at risk and disrupted supply chains for companies from Apple to Tesla. And don't forget sanctions. In 1983, the flows of trade subject to export or import bans was only worth about 0.3% of global gross domestic product. By 2019, that share had risen more than fivefold. And now sweeping embargoes triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine and efforts by countries to secure their own supplies by barring sales abroad, like India's recent ban on wheat exports, have pushed that figure higher still. Viewed from one angle, all of this is part of a global rupture that pits Western democracy and the free markets against Chinese and Russian authoritarianism. I'm not going to get into a debate with these guys, but uh, it, 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 anyway, moving on. But it's not necessary to believe in a struggle between good and evil or expect the rival camps to separate behind a new Iron Curtain to see the prospective cost. About six trillion dollars of goods, equivalent to seven percent of global GDP, are traded between democratic and autocratic countries. Um, Blah, 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 I'm going to skip over a little bit, but the result, global trade plunges by some 20% relative to a scenario without the decoupling falling back to its levels at the end of the 1990s before China joined the WTO as a share of GDP. That is a huge and wrenching change. All countries would have to shift resources towards activities they are less good at. A chunk of the productivity that's associated with trade would be lost. In the long term, a rollback <clears throat> of globalization to late 1990s levels would leave the world 3.5% poorer than if trade stabilizes at its current share of output and 15% poorer relative to a scenario of global ties strengthening, which of course is not going to happen. The model shows that another 7% of existing relationships would shift between blocks. In concrete terms, that might mean factories making goods for U.S. markets moving from China to, say, India or Mexico. As that example suggests, there would be some winners, but the transition would take time and cause severe bottlenecks along the way, ushering in a period of high and volatile inflation. 
as Kenneth Rogoff, then a top economist at the International Monetary Fund, warned us back in 2003. This was his prediction eight, 18 or 19 years ago, quote, the global economy now appears immersed in a long wave of low inflation, but experience suggests that many factors, notably heightened conflict that reverses globalization, can bring it to an end. Close quote, and the article goes on and on from there, and you can pick up a link. But anyway, the I think what Bloomberg is trying to say is, uh, sorry, you can you can expect more six dollar and fifty nine cent a gallon milk, and uh, you will be wishing that gas was uh, a cheap four dollars and eighty nine cents a gallon in about six weeks from now. Uh, the age of scarcity has begun now. Uh, of, of course, we here in the U.S., uh, we're going to be the last to see it. Uh, go talk to a sub-Saharan African. Uh, another article that I don't have time to get into. Uh, talking about, what is it, 18 million sub-Saharan Africans uh, on the verge of starvation here in the age of scarcity, I believe, this summer. And then uh, you can imagine how many comments from a planet of 8 billion people commented on 18 million people uh, getting ready to starve to death in sub-Saharan Africa. Obviously, zero people out of a planet of 8 billion people thinking that story was worth a comment. But uh, I'm not even going to read that story. And uh, But I'm going to move on for the few of you still with me, from The Guardian, suicides indicate wave of doomerism over escalating climate crisis. And they, this is, article is almost like in three parts, and I'm going to read the middle part. What they're talking about in the beginning, they're talking about people who have committed very public suicides. Uh, to try supposedly to call attention to uh, the climate crisis and hopefully, like, like what? Motivate people to do anything about it? Uh, anyway, uh, okay, but I'm going to go in. So they talk about people... Uh, We're going, I like this. We're going to start with this. Now, there is an F-bomb here. I kind of like this guy who is, of course, a breeder, Peter Kalmus, a NASA climate scientist, as he handcuffed himself to a J.P. Morgan Chase building during a protest last month. Quote, we are heading towards fucking catastrophe. We are going to lose everything. And there you go. Uh, that sums it up. NASA climate scientists chaining themselves to bank buildings, talking about heading towards fucking catastrophe. We are going to lose everything. Uh... You can find an interview with uh, Sandy Shell has interviewed that fellow over at Environmental Coffee House. You can go find her interview with him. Anyway, yet most of us who fret about climate change do so discreetly. Studies have shown that while alarm over worsening wildfires, droughts, flooding, and social unrest 
is on the is on the rise. That alarm is on the rise. Not many of us talk about climate angst with others to avoid political arguments or simply to avoid bringing down the mood. Those who do speak out are often younger activists. Research has shown that half of the popula half of people between the ages of 16 and 25 believe the earth may be doomed while three quarters feel anxiety when they think or hear about climate change. Some speak openly of not wanting to bring children into a hotter, harsher world. Quote, this is Margaret Klein Salomon, a clinical psychologist turned climate activist. Quote, living in climate truth is like living in a nightmare. It is absolutely horrible, and I can understand why the, the vast majority of Americans don't do it. But the worst part is that everyone's acting normal. It's like we are zombies. The sense of helplessness and hopelessness is holding back conversations and political action. Close quote. Yes. Solomon leads an organization called the Climate Awakening. Yes. That facilitates, quote, climate emotions conversations, both in person and virtually, that encourage people to open up about their climate fears. Solomon said that many describe living in a sort of waking, powerless nightmare where an obvious catastrophe is unfolding, but society just blithely ignores it. Quote, some people have described it as like they are at a funeral, but everyone else is treating it like a party. People are still going to college, planning for retirement, doing all the things as if the future will look just like the past. When we know that's not true, there is a delusion of normalcy, close quote. There are regular attempts to jolt us from political inertia, whether that is the increasingly exasperated excoriations of the Swedish school striker turned movement leader, Greta Thunberg, the soaring success of the Netflix film Don't Look Up, which satirized the blasé attitudes of politicians and the media towards scientific warnings, or the increasingly frantic pronouncements of Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, who has said that continuing use of fossil fuels is madness and the work of dangerous radicals. Uh, the desire to shake people from a pall of complacency may, may have also motivated the, these people they talked about earlier to commit suicide, although Susan Clayton a professor of psychology and environmental studies at the College of Worcester cautions it is risky to assume, to assume the full motivations behind a suicide. As social creatures who feed off each other's cues, however, we are all affected by what Clayton calls, quote, collective ignorance. Quote, if there is a fire and we look around us and see no one is doing anything, you can feel you are expected to do nothing, not realizing that other people are looking to you for the same reason. 
there is this sense that people around us are not only doing nothing about this problem, but not even acting like it is important, close quote. I'm sure Book Hermit would have something to say about that. For all the efforts of various activists and promises by governments to restrain dangerous global heating, carbon emissions leapt globally last year as we reverted back to the polluting status quo before corona panic lockdowns. Wildfires are now a year-round menace to the U.S. West. On Friday, it hit 51C in Pakistan, that's around 125 Fahrenheit, while India has baked in such extreme record heat that dozens of people have died and birds are falling from the sky. The UN has warned that a broken perception of risk based on, quote, optimism, underestimation, and invincibility, close quote, is fueling such disasters. Oil and gas companies are planning unhindered a massive tranche of, quote, carbon bomb drilling projects that will propel us firmly towards climate catastrophe. Yes, and then they uh, switch gears again for the last third of this story, talking about, you know, where they start uh, heading off into the apocalyptism. There is much to be anxious of, but some Climate scientists argue we cannot let a wave of doomerism become paralyzing. There is still, still, still hope oh, that concerted action will avoid the worst. That momentum is building for a cleaner, greener world. Yes, and then of course we hear from Michael Mann, quote, Climate doomerism can be harmful because it robs us of agency, the agency we still have in determining our future. I fear that doomism Doomism and defeatism leads us down the path of inaction or worse, such as <laughs> Anyway, guys, we can go on with Michael Mann and his apocalyptimism. It's all the doomer's fault. Yes. It is the doomer's fault uh, that the uh, planet's in the shape that it's in. It's just if 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 the doomers uh, would just stop being such Debbie Downers. Anyway, we will pick up this theme if I uh, have a chance to tomorrow with my uh, Hopium Roundup round. If I even get into it, it is going to be ninety two degrees tomorrow, I believe, in New York. 92 degrees in May in New York, baby, and uh, the little dog and I have to uh, head out in the kayak to go uh, rob some uh, water lilies and uh, bog garden plants while we still can. I highly suggest you get out there and rob some bog garden plants on your kayak while you still can. We will try to get back to Manga Bay next Friday. My guys. Okay, little dog, did you survive? <laughs>